Well, hello, boys and girls. It's when I feel like it o'clock. I'm Pearl of Wisdom, and you're listening to my NHL Pearls of Wisdom. And uh, we got two of the finest in the land here. We're coming together a lot. It's crazy. <laughs> it's awesome. I had to beg them at first, and now they've kind of accepted me in a little bit, and I feel like I'm one of the cool kids by the, the, the you know, the bike racks there. They're cool. <laughs> but anyways. We're, we are doing a series in my channel. We're doing a series on all the channels, actually. Peyton's got a series going on every team right now that in their off season. Uh, John has a series going on where he's doing collaborations with a whole bunch of different uh, uh, po- uh, bit YouTubers out there who like certain teams. I did one for him. Peyton's done one for him. And there's a lot of great. It's freaking awesome. The frolic is endless. Frolic is endless. Anyways. So we got them together again, and as you can see, they got a little, they know how to do the background stuff. I just got the Seattle apartment. <laughs> That's it. Because the I had to have it for the Perlocopter to give you your <laughs> subscriptions, everybody. That's why you hit the subscribe button. So anyways, we're going to do the Minnesota Wild. And we're going to talk about what the Minnesota Wild did in the offseason and how that projects for the future of the Minnesota Wild. Um, a lot of interesting things happened with the Minnesota Wild. I think one of the first things, well, um, first of all, let's talk about the draft. That was because that could be maybe the biggest part of uh, what happens with the Minnesota Wild here. Uh, we'll start with Peyton. Um, we uh, we won't go through every pick, but there is one major pick <laughs> that happened that maybe changed the whole landscape. Of what the Minnesota Wild's all about. Is that right, Peyton? What do you think? Yeah, about that? Uh, Marco Rossi, absolute terrific player for the Ottawa 67s, putting up 120 points in 56 games. He was absolutely amazing uh, for the Ottawa uh, 67s. Uh, Rossi is a future player for the Minnesota Wild. And over the past couple decades for the Minnesota Wild, ever since they came into the NHL, we have never actually seen them pick a centerman really in the draft. I mean, sure, they had Mikhail Granlin, but they've never had, I think, a type of level of a player like Marco Rossi. Marco Rossi, I think, will definitely change the landscape of the Minnesota Wild for the future. And there was even some later on picks, too, like the Ryan O'Rourke move they did uh, in the second round, picking up a very solid defensive defenseman and and continuing that developing of that defensive core, especially since Suter's already 35 years old. You know you're going to see that steady decline in him. Ryan Rourke definitely won't replace Suter in that spot, but will definitely be a nice prospect to have for the future. But Marco Rossi, without a doubt, is the future player that the Minnesota Wild need for sure. Yeah, what? Did, how about you, John? You, did you like the, I mean, of course you liked it. <laughs> can you believe that they got him in the ninth spot? Right. No, I, I can't believe that Rossi dropped all the way down to nine. This is a guy that I think is going to be a superstar point producing center and that is exactly what the minnesota wild need because if you look at their roster down the middle is a problem right now for the minnesota wild and they've got a whole bunch of third line centers on their roster but they don't have that top end talent and marco rossi whether he comes in and plays this season or it's another year before he comes in it's he's going to be that top end talent at down the middle that they desperately, desperately need. And I think that was just an absolutely tremendous pick that just kind of fell on their lap with all those teams, you know, passing over Rossi. And it was a no brainer when he was still on the board at nine and he could drastically change the future of this franchise. Yeah. Uh, Buffalo picks his line mate. Who, <laughs> yeah. Buffalo picks a player that's not even the best player on his team and is available in the spot. <laughs> okay, that's enough about Buffalo. That was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, that was amazing that they got that for good for them. Um, um, I guess I'll go on then to another move that happened when they uh, picked up Benino, and I'll go back to John on this. It was an interesting move, and I know that you've spoken already a lot about this, so I'll let you chime in now, and I'll pass it over to to Peyton after that. But uh, I know you have a lot of. Uh, opinions on that move yeah i mean i this is such a such a head scratcher in my opinion where i know that they're a team that needed centers and needed help down the middle but you look at nick benino he's 32 years old he's a guy that's 
been a really good third line center throughout his NHL career, but he's been a third line center. And that's really not what this team needed. When you look at what they already have down the middle, it's a whole lot of third line centers, especially with Eric Stahl now gone. And I just, they give up a young player in Luke Coonan, who I like a lot. I'm a big, big fan of Luke Coonan. I think he can be, he can become a, a second line scoring power forward and, they give they give him up for a guy who's almost 10 years older is not really what they need and a you know who did have a really good season last year he was second on the predators in goals with 18 but you're you're not you know what you're going to get with Nick Benino it's not like he has a lot of upward potential whereas Coonan I still think has a good amount of upwards potential and I just I look at that move and it's like why what's the point of doing that when you need you need younger players and you need more talented players and you go out and you give up a young player with upwards potential for a 32 year old third line center. Yeah. Um, Peyton, we've been talking before and you seem to have a, a pretty good heartbeat with the Minnesota wild. Maybe uh, why, why do you think they made such a deal? Do you know? I, I think the main reason why is analytically. You look at Luke Coonan's stats, and yeah, he definitely does put up a lot of points, but definitely his analytics look a bit wonky, right? His defensive stats are a little bit low offensively. You look at Nick Benino, and it's just it's terrific all over the place, and that's what you expect from Nick Benino, right? Um, he's been getting a little bit more ice time. He's around 16 minutes, and it's not... Like, it was definitely a head-scratchy move for sure. Like, you initially mo look at the move, and you're getting someone that's 10 years older. And you're definitely thinking it's a little bit older. But maybe they're bringing it in for maybe a little bit of experience. Nick Benino's won a couple of cups before. Maybe they believe Nick Benino could be a second-line centerman playing alongside of Johansson or Kevin Fiola or whoever they're going to be throwing him up against. But I honestly, maybe maybe it's a, a move for rebuilding. Maybe they're trying to go after uh, i'm not too sure what bill Guerin is doing he is definitely taking a weird approach with the minnesota wild and and that trade was a, definitely a confusing one uh but nick benino is a, a definite player that is pretty good and they got a couple extra picks as well in this draft uh which was a pretty deep draft as we all know um now luke Kunin could have developed into a very nice guy yeah but I think Bill Guerin is either trying to make this team look completely garbage or he's trying to build a contender in a totally different way that we have never really expected it. Yeah, it seems like an outside of the box move for sure. And I'm trying to wrap my head around it. I'm, I'm also respecting Bill Guerin like you are as well. Uh, Bill, I would say there is one thing I have to say. This has been three GMs now where I've heard murmurs of problems with Kunin. So we don't know what goes on in the room, what mm -hmm. is off, what his off-season habits are, all of those things like that. And if those things don't line up with the philosophy of the team, maybe we'll. And we heard this. The funny thing is, is it seems Poyle brings on a lot of these players because those murmurs were around Duchesne, those murmurs mm -hmm. were around Turris, those yep. murmurs were around a lot of these. So uh, if those murmurs are out there, and many, and and. Uh, um, Gurren saying, I don't really like that energy around my team. I'm going to bring in a guy. We lost Koibu, right? So maybe we're bringing in a guy that can help continue to help Eck become what he's going to you be. Also, uh, you also got to remember, I think the reason why that deal kind of went through is because the deal between Nashville and the Minnesota Wild where it was Kevin Fiala for Mikael Granlin. It was kind of the same deal where Minnesota got the really young player and the Nashville Predators got kind of like a rental, which I mm -hmm. think is what maybe David Pulley and Bill Guerin were looking at. Like David Pulley was like, Hey, can you like repay me back for that Kevin that Fiola trade? Awesome. And because Kevin Fiola turned fantastic for the Minnesota wild, absolutely terrific. So maybe it was just an inside deal between Pulley and Guerin saying, Hey, can you give me a young player dude, back since we gave you one? That's a killer take, dude. That is a <laughs> killer take. Seriously. <laughs> No, that's probably exactly what happened there. When Granlin was traded, they, they were having problems, and they say, look, if you can't turn him around, we'll do something for you later on. Mm -hmm. That happens all the time in the NHL. Um, like for Athanasiu to Edmonton, I bet you they'll get that one of those seconds back later on in another deal. 
What a great take. I never even thought about that. Great, great take. Absolutely, no doubt about it. So that brings me to another one. My gosh, everybody. Uh, <laughs> Talbot. Okay, we'll go back to you, Peyton. Okay, uh, you know what? Talbot, so, Talbot's good. I, I, I loved him when he was in Edmonton. You know what? I really, I always had hope for Cam Talbot, and I, I still do. Cam Talbot played great in the playoffs for the Calgary Flames. Even during the regular season, he wasn't too bad. But the one biggest issue for Cam Talbot is you can't play him too much. And I can't stress that enough. You can't play this man enough, or you can't... Because when we played him in Edmonton, he played 73 games. He was playing every single game for the past two years, and it exhausted him. And that's why he started playing like crap. He mentally couldn't prepare himself because he was playing every single game. He didn't have a backup. When his backup went out there, the team didn't win. So all the stress was on Cam Talbot when he was with the Oilers. When he went off to the Philadelphia Flyers, I mean, he still struggled mentally because, I mean, he wasn't there for very long. When he went to Calgary, he had more of a break. He had more of a time to just kind of chillax and let David Riddick do his thing. And if David Riddick struggled, Cam Talbot can go do his thing. I think this is a good deal for the Minnesota Wild, especially since you have a tandem between Talbot and Staylock. Staylock does really good when you give him a, a limited amount of games and same with Talbot. I think it's going to be a great tandem. And that's how the NHL is kind of going now and nowadays is with these tandems. If you overwork a goalie, your goalie's not going to last that long. If you do a tandem, your goalie could go for maybe 10, 12 years longer than what he usually might go. So I think it's a really good deal for the Wild. What about you, John? I saw you have a little bit of the expression before you got started there. Yeah, we, we might finally have a little bit of disagreement here <laughs> after all this Whoa. time. Good. Good. I'm I'm not big on Cam Talbot. I I think he can be good in the right situation. I, I completely agree you can't play him too much, and if you put too much pressure on him, then he's going to fold, and we saw that with in Edmonton. He did have a good year last year, and that's the one thing that kind of gives me a little bit of hope that this might actually go okay. Uh, he, he played well with Calgary. Uh, I, I thought, I thought Cam Talbot was done. I thought when he, the way that things went for him in Edmonton, with the exception of that one year where they made the playoffs and everyone had a really good year, um, his, his time in Edmonton was pretty much a disaster other than that one year. It, It did not go how the Oilers were hoping when they brought him in. And I, I thought he was done at the NHL level, but obviously Calgary went out. They took a chance on him. They brought him in to play in that one that you know one A one B type role with Riddick, and he had a really solid season last year. So I might be too cynical on Cam Talbot. I think there's a chance this does work out, and I really Staylock played kind of underratedly good last season and mm-hmm. in, in a year where Devin Dubnik was ho- horrible just absolutely horrible <laughs> so as a 1a 1b type situation I think if you split the games between those two guys um I think there's a chance it might actually end up being an okay tandem I just I I don't trust either one of those guys to kind of carry the load and, and be an actual starting goaltender I think they're both better suited to be kind of 1b's and, you know, I look at the Wild, they're a team that's probably not going to score a lot of goals unless they make some major changes to that forward group. And I don't know if you can win with two 1B goaltenders, you know, when, you, when you're when you not a team that's going to put up four, four goals a game. If you're only putting up two goals a game, you're going to need your goaltender to only be giving up, you know, two goals a game. And I, I don't know if we're going to get numbers like that out of a, a duo of Staylock and Talbot, but... He had a really solid year last year, so there's definitely the possibility that he he could end up, you know, being being solid there. Yeah, um, it's looking at what he has done. It, it's worrisome a little bit, um, but like you said, in in Calgary he did well. He became. This is the reason why I'm kind of leaning to where it could be a really good move. Is he was what everybody knew he was going to be when he was younger. He became that in Calgary. Mm-hmm. So is there there's a really I think there is a good chance he could continue that along based on his talent level overall. He just got absolutely crushed in Edmonton. And I think that's the reason why Peyton and I are both mm-hmm. rooting for him a lot. He's a fantastic human being. He's one of yeah, the like nice- when 
when Greatest Talbot, uh, sorry for cutting you off there, but when Talbot first came into the team, we were horribly defensive yeah. in 2016, and Talbot put up great numbers. The second year, we really did kill him. We had like Jonas Gustin and Brassois as our backup goalies, <laughs> which I mean definitely did not help Cam Talbot. So having Alex Stalock is it's a perfect backup for him, and I think. I'm hoping he'll excel, but as a 33-year-old goalie, you'd never really know, and you never really know with goalies' point. Mm-hmm. It's it's a guessing game with goalies, practically. You have to get really lucky to get a good goalie. You could either him turn out to be Anton Kudubin, or he could be the next Devin Dumnik. Who really mm-hmm. knows? Yeah, um, like I said, I think for both of us are really rooting for him more than anything because he was great in the Edmonton organization, never complained, and he had every right to. Seriously, they put defense mm-hmm. in front of him year after year. They were just absolutely pathetic. Anyways, yeah. Uh, and an- another thing that bodes well for him is Minnesota is so good defensively. Oh. And you look at that that defense core. I mean, you've got Spurgeon and Suter as your top pair. You've got uh, Dumba Brodine. You've got Carson Soucy, who looks like a really solid young guy coming up. They got Greg Patteron. Uh, Brad Hunt is kind of your six, seven guys. They have a really solid defense core. So if the defense in front of Talbot is significantly better than what he's had in the past, then that could certainly help boost his numbers as well. Mm-hmm. All right. The next part, I'm going to make a two part since you already kind of segued into one of the big <laughs> things that never happened or may happen is it was all the way. It was through all the airway. I mean, they weren't even hiding it or saying it wasn't true. The Dumbo was on the trade block all summer, right? And uh, nothing came of it. Um, and now they're talking about keeping him and they're really happy about it. Garen sort of backpedaling to realize that they weren't able to get what they want for him and what have you. Um, also, I'm going to combine the two um, and say the stall for Johans- Johansson trade. Uh, what do you think of both of those happenings and how that reflects on Garen and what he's doing with this team? And I'm going to start with John on this one. Well, uh, to, to start, the Stalford Johansson trade, I'm, I'm still kind of confused on that one. I mean, uh, <laughs> oh, you got <laughs> you traded for the worst player. Like, Eric Stahl's still, uh, I know he's in his 30s now, but he's still a really solid second-line center. And he's first-line center for Minnesota, but they have no depth down the middle. On, a, on most teams, he's a second-line center, but he's still a really solid one. And Marcus Johansson, I mean, if you're getting Washington Capitals Marcus Johansson, then maybe this is a better deal. But what Johansson's done over the past few years has not been anything special. He's a third-line player, and, and he's had injuries. Well, including concussion problems, which does not bode well for long-term sustained success. So that was a complete what are they doing here deal, in my opinion. I was really, really confused by that. I, I, I don't see how it helped them in any way. And as far as Dumba goes, um, <laughs> I think it comes down to they weren't going to get what they thought they were going to get for him. And they decided to say, OK, well, we're better off keeping him at this point if that's all that's the market is for him. He, he was on the trade market forever. There were so many talks over the past year about Dumba getting moved and them making a big deal. And then when Brodeen signed his long term contract, it was like, all right, that's it. Dumba's gone. He, he'll be traded next week. And it never materialized. And I just think that comes down to Garen did not get, wasn't getting offered what he thought he was going to get from Matt Dumba. So he says, you know what? He's a, he's a darn good defenseman. I'm just going to keep him, and we're going to keep our top four together, which, I mean, when you look at top fours around the league, Suter, Spurgeon, Dumba, and Brodeen, that's a really good top four defense right there. I think the way they were looking at with uh, Matt Dumba is, of course, he's, they look at as a top pairing right-handed defenseman, which a lot of teams over over value right-handed defensemen way yep. too much, and that's why you don't really see too many defensemen trades or big right-handed defensemen move around mm-hmm. because of the fact it is it's a hot commodity. Matt yep. Dumpa is definitely not the best defenseman. He is great offensively, but he's definitely not the greatest defensive guy out there um, compared to Brodine, Spurgeon, Suter. Right? He's one of the mm-hmm worst guys on the team um do i think matt dumba will ever be traded probably i i think probably next year maybe bill garen will lower his 
trade value of him maybe a little bit. Maybe he'll go after centerman. And I think they could have made maybe a really nice move to pick up a solid second line centerman and make a move. But it's the same thing with the Brock Besser rumors. Is it ever mm-hmm. going to really come true? Is it just rumblings? Yeah, it's just rumblings. We really don't know what's going on in the back. It could possibly be the the case where they do trade them, but I don't know. We'll have to see in the later on future. Uh, the Marcus Johansson deal, that was a, definitely a head scratcher when I first read it. When I looked at the analytics, I'm like, Buffalo won this deal without a doubt. But then I was like thinking today, I'm like, well, the Buffalo Sabres curse. Every player that goes to the Buffalo Sabres instantly turns into a crapshoot, right? <laughs> I mean, Marcus Johansson has been through the crapshoot playing for New Jersey and having some of the worst years in New Jersey and not just having an offensive team. Boston Bruins was really the only team he actually had a good team for, and he didn't do that bad in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Definitely not the greatest, but not, not the worst. And Buffalo, he definitely wasn't the greatest either. But like we were saying, if we're not getting the Washington Capitals worth Marcus Johansson, it's it's the worst trade ever that Minnesota's Minnesota Wild could possibly trade or do. But why do they need to bring in another playmaker when you already have Zach Prize and you have Zuccarello and you have Joel Eric's neck? Why are you picking up more playmakers when you need more goal scoring? All you really have is Fiala and then you're going to want to kind of like rely on Kaprizov. Like Kaprizov might not be your guy this year. He might take a little bit of time before he really gets ready. So that deal was definitely a head scratch, scratcher, but who knows what Bill Guerin's plans are. It's either that they were building this team or they're really trying to become a true contender by picking up a lot of big heavyweights like Nick Bukestad. I don't know what they're really trying to do. They're definitely <laughs> confusing when you're trying to get like really deep into them, but <laughs> they're confusing. I, I even forgot about Puke, the Pukestad move, that, just because he lives in Minnesota. Uh, <laughs> he's a Minnesotan, so we better go get Pukestad, who is like, I I do not look at analytics, but I can I, I have a tendency, my eye test seems to work out well with analytics, mm-hmm. and Pukestad's analytics have got to be absolutely de- horrible. They must be, I would have to imagine. Um, the Johansson move, I will say this. I have a feeling that they wanted to move Stahl because they wanted to have some young players move on or whatever the case mm-hmm. may be. And um, Buffalo was the only team out there that had some interest because they want Stahl to go over there and uh, maybe maybe smack Skinner over the head a few times because they used to play together mm-hmm. to get him actually playing like he's supposed to, even if he could play like a $5 million player instead of uh, you know getting a three million dollar player making nine million dollars a year so i can see it from buffalo's perspective there possibly what he's looking at here is that johansson comes over has a good year in minnesota they put him in the best situation possible play him on the wing which is what he should be he's not a centerman he needs to play on the wing put him on the wing let him play with some somebody that's going to bring his point totals up and then trade him in the Trade him at the trade deadline, maybe be able to get a third or fourth for him. You maybe know, get way it, more. Then it's, then it's it, not a bad deal, right? And yeah, maybe that's get, what the Benito uh, trade was about, too. Yeah, yeah. they're going to get more value out of Johansson and Benito just because of the age factor. With Johansson still being young, you could possibly get him on a cheaper deal if he's not playing fantastic, right? There's multiple things that the Minnesota Wild are really can do with the way that they're going with this team. Like, you could either call him a rebuilder. Or you could try to say they're a contender with what they're trying to do. Um, but yeah, the Johansson, you have to play them on the wing. I totally agree with yeah. you on that one. It's oh, sort yeah. of, it's, it's, sorry, sorry about that. I was just going to say it sort of makes sense when we start thinking about it because all of these guys have value. So mm-hmm. he can go in there and say, I don't know what this team's going to be. We just got Kaprasov. How is that going to fit in? How's Greenway going to start improving? How's that going to be? Mm-hmm. All of these guys can improve greatly next year. And if they do then they don't really need to do much and they can keep the veterans and move on. If mm-hmm. they don't, then you've got Benito, even, you know, Benito and Johansson you can get picks for. Sorry to jump on you there, John. What were you going to say? No, I was just going to say, can we please stop pretending that Marcus Johansson is a center? Like, <laughs> yeah. th- th- when when did people decide that he played center? Because he is... He has only been good as a winger in the <laughs> NHL. His best years in Washington, he played on the left wing. Totally. Um, and totally. like then he tanked in New Jersey, 
And when he went to Boston, he had a really good playoffs in 2018-19 with the Bruins. He was playing on the wing with Charlie Coyle in the middle. Like, this guy is so much better on the wing than he is down the middle. And and teams seem to, like, still think that he's a center. He's not a center. Play him on the wing. Please. I mean, the definition of bad centerman is just looking at the face-offs. And, like, (laughs) last year, he was 40% in the face-off draw. Oh. With New Jersey, he was 31. He didn't take too much face-offs in New Jersey. Even in Washington, some years he did face-off, but he was like 46, 34 one year. Uh, it was, it, it's really bad. He's definitely not a centerman, and I don't know why people think he is. He's, he's a winger. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely no doubt about it. Absolutely I can't believe there's winger. been so many teams that have tried to play him up the middle no. and then just kept on doing it over. Let's put it this way. In Buffalo, he played up the middle because he was the best player that they had to play up the middle. That is a team problem. <laughs> if, if he's your, if he's if he's up the middle because you can't find anybody better, then you need to find some better players on yeah. your team. Jesus. Okay, guys, this has been friggin' awesome. Uh, thank you very much for coming in. We we actually spit out some sarcasm today and everything. Uh, <laughs> Minnesota. Uh, it's going to be interesting to watch what Bill Guerin does. I think everybody roots for Billy because Billy was a great player. Everybody loved him, always loved him. And I love him to see to, – I hope he's one of those guys that we've talked about, like a Joe Sackick or Eisenman or Blake in L.A., where he's that X player that comes in and is brilliant and does fantastic things with that team. And it's very possible he is after what we think we said today. Um, you know, when I went into it, I, I didn't look at a lot of the – uh, I didn't look at the, a lot of the sides you guys brought up here where B might be actually doing some pretty good stuff here. He's mm-hmm. just waiting to see how this team's going to look, and he's giving himself options with uh, – with, uh, so that being said, Minnesota for the future. Do you, where do you guys think uh, Minnesota for the future? Give me uh, 30 seconds. Peyton, what do you think? Uh, I think the Minnesota Wild, uh, they're definitely going to be a future contender, uh, but they got to get lucky with Kaprasov and Rosso. I think those are your two future players that you're going to be looking at, and Kevin Fiala. I think the Minnesota Wild have a great future. They just got to get some luck on their side, and once they do, I think this team could definitely be maybe a future Stanley Cup contender. John? Yeah, I, I think they certainly have the building blocks there to build a contending team. I still think I think they need a long term solution at goaltender. And I don't know Mm -hmm. a lot about the prospects that they have coming up at the goalie position. But if one of those guys can turn into a franchise starting goalie, I think that will help a lot. The building blocks are there. I think over the next couple of years, they're going to sell off some of these veteran guys and try and get some more picks and bring some younger guys in or some prospects and just get some more younger talent in there. But um, if they just keep building around Rossi and Kaprizov and this great defense that they have, then they should be a playoff team. Yeah, um, Kalkinen is the goaltender that they're really high on. He looks like he could be fantastic. And I am higher on this team than when we started, seriously. <laughs> I really am a lot higher. And I thank you guys for coming in. These guys supplying the pearls, head to their channels, go off with you. Not yet, just wait till the video's over. But after that, you go over to Peyton's <laughs> channel. You go over to um, John's channel at, uh, you can see Off the Wall Hockey there, Peyton on the radio. Thanks for coming in, guys. You've been amazing. Have a great day, everybody. That's our full 42%. Lots of love to ya.